calling this meeting of the tax committee to order. Um, first item on the agenda is approving the minutes for January 10th, 2023. Um, Vice Chair Norris, do I have a motion to move the minutes from January 10th? Madam Chair, I move the minutes from January 10th. Thank you so much. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, um, all those in favor of approving the minutes, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. And the minutes for January 10th, 2023 are adopted. So today we're going to continue uh, where we left off um, on our house research overview. Um, again, please, uh, I think we had a great conversation yesterday. Please just raise your hand if you have any questions as we're going along and we'll, um, and we'll stop our presenters. Um, and welcome to the committee, Alex and Chris, Alex Hagler and Chris Clayman. Please go ahead, um, introduce yourself for the record. And Alex, I think this is the first time, Ms. Hagler, this is the first time that you've appeared in front of the committee. So if you could just talk about like some of the, the areas that, that you um, oversee for us, that would be great. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, <coughs> Madam Chair and members. My name is Alex Hagler. I'm with House Research Department and I cover sales tax and some of the um, state excise taxes like cigarette, um, gambling, cannabis, sports betting, and other lawful gambling. Um, so we're going to pick up where we left off yesterday and um, start discussion of sales and use tax. Um, this graph here um, shows the state sales tax collections for the past 10 years. Um, and as the top of the slide indicates, the um, fiscal 23 forecast is that the um, collections will be around $9.2 billion. Um, and that also includes the motor vehicle sales tax. Um, which I'll just note at the beginning is typically the jurisdiction of the Transportation Committee, so we're not um, going into detail on that um, right now. But, um, you know, when it comes up, we can certainly talk about it later. Um, so as um, some other presenters discussed yesterday about progressive and regressive taxes, sales tax is regressive. Um, meaning that those in a lower income bracket um, pay a bigger portion of their income um, in the sales tax than the top income earners do. And so this graph here uh, shows that the bottom 20% of income earners paid 6% of their income in sales tax, while the top 20% um, only paid 1.7% of their income in sales tax. Um, but kind of on the flip side, um, when discussing the total amount of tax paid, this graph shows that the top 20% of income earners paid 45% of the tax collected, um, while the bottom 20% uh, paid 8%. And so top, top income earners pay more of the sales tax collected, but less of their um, annual income compared to lower income taxpayers, if that makes sense. Ms. Hagler? Just to go back to the previous slide um, uh, about the effective sales tax rate by population quintile, can you talk a little bit, uh, we heard last, uh, yesterday, <laughs> I guess it was, um, about um, how, you know, businesses that are, are organized as pass-through entities, a lot of that, a lot of those, um, a lot of those taxpayers are included in this first quintile. And can you just talk a little bit about that interaction? I guess I'm trying to get my head around, like, if you are, like, do you include those pass-through entities when you're calculating what the effective sales tax rate is for the first quintile? Or I'm not sure if my question makes sense, but could you tell me a little bit about that interaction, maybe? Yeah, Madam Chair, um, I might throw that to another member of the team. Okay. Chris, Madam, Mr. Clayman sitting Madam, right Madam there, Chair. I see. Uh, Madam Chair. Yeah. yeah. Ms. Representative Davis. You are the chair. Your questions always make sense. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that, Representative Davids. Uh, ma Madam Chair, I think Ms. Templin may, from House Fiscal is going to come down on that one. Great, thank you. Ms. Templin, whenever you're ready. Madam Chair, Cynthia Templin, House Fiscal. Um, the, the sales tax slide that you see 
Um, it is the effective tax rate is the ratio of taxes paid to income. So the, the taxpayers included in this graph include the who um, the taxpayers are the entities that remit sales tax. So that would be um, various business and retailers um, and to the extent um, pass-throughs um, remit sales tax, then they would be included in the slide. Representative Anderson, it looks like you're going to give me an assist maybe here. Yeah, Madam Thank Chair. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think um, the way I interpreted your question is are all taxpayers in here, including those that are, that have tax, um, their income is from a tax, you know, flow through entity? Um, and um, it, the answer would be yes. Um, because that's this is just the income of taxpayers, whether it's wage income, pass through entity, business income, however, whatever income that is. This is their end income. This is uh, uh, Madam Chair, Representative Anderson. So it is uh, this slide is the uh, shows the effective tax rate and it is the ratio of taxes paid. So any entity that remits sales taxes would be included in this graph. And then also included is kind of the denominator for this, um, for this measure is, is household income. So you can right. see the distribution of various entities that remit sales tax. Um, um, the distribution of who remits sales tax um, um, based on, you know, income tax, I mean, sorry, household income. So it's that, it's that measure of effective tax rate. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Hagler. Sorry, uh, please go ahead. No, that's okay, Madam Chair. I appreciate the um, fiscal assist on this one. <laughs> um, they're much better at the graph than I am. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So I think we are on slide 35 now. So the um, combined sales tax rate for the state is 6.875%. 6.5% of that is the base general rate, while um, 0.375 is um, an additional rate that was added by um, a 2009 legacy amendment, and that will run through 2039. So it's not permanent, um, but in a few years, uh, the legislature will have to decide what to do with that. Um, the state constitution dictates how that 0.375 is um, dedicated between different legacy funds. And um, once we get into hearing bills, you'll see on a revenue estimate that um, if a bill is proposing a change to a, a sales tax, it'll show the effect on the general fund as well as those legacy funds. So when we get there, um, that's just something to be aware of. Um, so the base is um, the sales tax applies uh, to gross receipts from uh, retail sales of tangible personal property made in the state or to a destination within the state unless an exemption applies. Um, typically services are not part of the sales tax base um, unless they are specifically included by statute. Um, an example of this would be that I found out recently is pet grooming. Very interesting. <laughs> I can get my hair done and it's not taxable, but my dogs, um, it's taxable for them to get hair. <laughs> um, and so as also as we discussed, it is a regressive tax and the tax is um, paid to the department by the retailers, um, but is collected at the point of sale by the purchasers. Um, some major exemptions to sales tax um, for individuals, the biggest exemptions are food, um, like groceries, clothing, and uh, prescription drugs. Um, cigarettes are also exempt from sales tax, but there is an in-lieu tax um, that we'll talk about a little bit later. And um, businesses have exemptions for capital equipment and farm machinery and some direct inputs. And sales to uh, the federal government and local governments um, are also exempt and um, sales to many charitable organizations as well. Um, so those of you who have been on taxes for a while know all about the Wayfair decision. This, is, this isn't breaking news anymore, but in 2018, the Supreme Court held that um, states may require remote sellers to uh, collect sales tax on certain transactions, um, even if those sellers don't have a physical presence within the state. 
Um, those conditions vary across different states, but in Minnesota, it's 200 transactions or $100,000 in sales. And um, that's over a 12 month period. Um, so Minnesota has been doing this for um, quite a while, but um, since 2018, it has just been the, the law of the land here. And as um, Minnesota is a member of the Streamlined Sales Tax Agreement, um, which has simplified and made uniform sales tax collection and administration for uh, retailers and its member states. Um, being a member of the agreement does put some restrictions on laws that can be enacted here. Um, as like a very simple example, um, if you wanted to, let's say, um, you know, say one product has the 6.5% sales tax, but another has an 8%. That is something that would be disallowed under the agreement and would um, put the state's membership, like, you know, in jeopardy. I'm not really sure how they, what they do when states are out of compliance, but there would be um, a discussion. Um, but of course, as legislators, it is your prerogative to pass laws. Um, but if something um, comes up that would run afoul of the agreement, that's something that, you know, staff would flag for you. Um, and then everyone's favorite topic, local sales taxes. Um, these are primarily the jurisdiction of the property tax division, but um, will come through in the omnibus bill or um, something that you might hear about from time to time. So if you make a purchase and you're looking at your receipt and you're like, oh, it says 7.3 something, I thought it was 6.8, it's because of wherever you made the purchase, there's a local tax in place. Um, so there are a few types. Um, the most common type are local option sales taxes, and those are general taxes that apply to any transaction. Um, these require legislative and voter approval, and um, uh, they do um, expire after a certain amount of time or once the project they're going to fund has been um, completely funded. County transportation taxes are statutory, and so um, counties don't need legislative approval um, for them. They can do by resolution of the county boards. Typically, they're 0.25% um, or 0.5%, and they are used to fund transportation and transit projects. Um, other special local taxes, lodging taxes, food and beverage taxes, entertainment taxes are a bit um, less common and they are not general in that they only apply to specific um, transactions. So here, just kind of an example of how this all works. Ms. Hagler, okay. sorry. Um, just going back to the previous slide, can you tell us a little bit about um, the jurisdictions that have automatic local option sales taxes or, the, or like what the the, it's cities of the first class kind of have a different um, local sales tax thing. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, Madam Chair, I think I'm not quite sure what you're referring to. Okay, but maybe we, we'll just, we'll catch up on it afterwards. How about that? Okay, sorry. Thank you. Um, so just an example of this, I bought, I purchased some pajamas and a hat for my daughter. And so you can see these are clothing. And so this is typically a non-tax transaction. However, um, I did pay shipping, which is taxable. So there was um, a little bit of tax assessed because shipping um, is a taxable um, transaction. So here you can see, and you don't usually get this kind of breakdown, but I thought it was kind of interesting that I would show you that um, this um, company is a Utah-based company, so it has the Minnesota state sales tax, the Ramsey County tax, which would be the transportation tax, and then the St. Paul city um, tax, which is where I had everything delivered. Um, these taxes are destination-based, and like I said, this company is based in Utah, so it's not like I'm paying Utah sales tax, I'm paying tax where I'm receiving the item, which was here in St. Paul. So it's just a little bit of a of a breakdown. And that is it for the sales tax, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Hagler. I'm not seeing uh, any questions, so we can probably move on to the next portion. <coughs> uh, Madam Chair and members, uh, I'm Chris Clayman from the House <coughs> Research Department. Uh, moving on to the estate tax. Uh, there, uh, there's only a couple slides on this, so it's, I'm going to cover it at a fairly, fairly high level, but if there's questions, um, I'm certainly happy to entertain those if um, it's 
okay with uh, the chair. Uh, just a moment, Mr. Clayman. Representative Swadzinski. I do have a question. Thank you, ma Madam Chair. Uh, I apologize for that. Um, so you said shipping is a s you pay sales tax on shipping. Is that only through traditional shippers, or like when you go through like the U.S. Postal ser Service, do you pay sales tax if you use that, or is it only if you use like UPS or like FedEx or one of those? Ms. Hagler. Um, Madam Chair and Representative Susinski, I'm. I want to say that's any carrier because it's through it's the retailer is what, who's charging you, not necessarily the um, the shipper. So the um, retailer is the one imposing the shipping fee, and if they're using USPS or UPS or any other company, it's it's kind of between them. So you would be paying the tax regardless. Representative Swinsinski. Thank you, Madam Chair. So it would be more if it's kind of almost like a wholesale tax. So in the same way, like cigarettes would be, it's collected on the front end. It's not seen. It's not like a portion of the sales tax. It's included in the price because I don't ever remember seeing sales tax on a, the shipping cost as a separate item. But Ms. Hagler, uh, M Madam Chair and Representative Swinsinski. Yes. So the shipping um, cost gets rolled into what? statute defines as the sale price and that is what becomes taxable. So it's not um, a separate charge or a separate tax. It all just kind of gets rolled into the cost of um, whatever it is you're purchasing. Representative Spitzinski. Thank you, Madam Chair. And then so if if you have an online retailer that offers free shipping, is that how do how does that there's technically a cost there and it's is it considered part of the product or is it like if it would be a clothing item or if it would be like how is those this the, the split between those two handled Ms. Hager. Uh, madam chair and representative Sosinski, i think um the shipper or the retailer might just make that up in the cost of the item but if you have free shipping then it obviously wouldn't be rolled into the total sales price um, so then if there's no cost to ship then you wouldn't be paying a tax on it so the retailer might make up that um, cost to them by increasing the price of the product, but um, then technically you wouldn't really be paying for the cost of the shipping. Representative Swidzinski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Th but you pay through the cost of the shipping, but not as a, a defined item on your bill. So if it's a defined item, you would pay sales tax, but if it's considered free shipping, if you include it in the cost of the item, then it's not. Ms. Um, Madam Chair and Representative Sosinski, that's correct. Um, if the item that you're purchasing is exempt from yeah. sales tax, like clothing, then I guess the retailer would just kind of eat the cost or bump up the price of the clothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Representative Swinsinski, you, you good? Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Hagler. All right, Mr. Clement. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Madam Chair and members, uh, moving on with the estate tax. Uh, the, the Minnesota state tax applies to uh, Minnesota resident decedents, so uh, decedents who are residents in Minnesota at the time that they died. Uh, and it also applies to all Minnesota situs property. Uh, so if you have a non-resident who's died but they have uh, real property, for instance, or tangible personal property that uh, has its situs, which is just to say that's just where it's usually kept um, or where the property is located at, um, they'd also be subject to uh, the estate tax on the value of that property. Um, the, uh, this is a graduated tax, so similar to the, somewhat similar to the uh, individual income tax. So the, the tax rates fluctuate between 13% and 16%, depending on the value of the uh, taxable estate. Uh, and the, the tax base, uh, as I think everyone knows, there's a federal estate tax. Uh, and so the state, the state estate tax uh, piggybacks on that federal estate tax. Uh, and so the starting point for the, um, the Minnesota state tax is the definition of the uh, federal taxable estate. Uh, and so the state, in some senses, conforms to that tax base. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that federal tax base then excludes things like charitable bequests and transfers to the surviving spouse. Mr. Uh, Clayman, mm -hmm. um, could you uh, explain to me, like, the real and tangible personal property? Like, what do those things mean? I don't know what those mean. Sure, Madam Chair. Uh, so real property would just be, um, you know, land, uh, buildings, anything classified as real property. I don't, I don't know what the reference would be exactly under the Internal Revenue Code, certainly under the income tax statutes, you know, there's definitions for real property. 
tangible personal property would be uh, things like, you know, a work of art, something like that. Okay. Um, uh, you know, items subject to the sales tax, so under the sales tax definition, that's you know, the, the primary item that's taxed is tangible personal property that's sold. Items like that. And then, of course, there's intangible property that can also be included in the, uh, the ta uh, estate of a resident decedent. And so intangible property would be things like stocks and bonds. So uh, <clears throat> thank you for that. So um, if you if a, as, if there was a bunch of intangible property that was that's part of an estate um, where the that that is still kind of like um, where a gain hasn't been realized basically like so but that that gets included in um, this calculation the value of the intangible property at the time of of the decedent's death is that how that works uh, madam chair uh, yes that's correct so the value of the estate is the value as the fair market value of the property as of the date of death of the decedent and so that goes for all kind all all class all types of property um, uh, and so and that's how the the value of that estate is then determined okay i just i guess i just want to mention um I carried a, a bill last year that uh, so if you if you buy um, you know stock and you hold on to it for 20 years and you make 20 million dollars on your stock and, um, and then you pass it on to your heir they get charged or they um, how does the how is that intangible property assessed for the purposes of calculating the estate tax so, uh, Madam Chair, I, I think maybe what you're getting at is the is the basis step up. Yeah. Uh, so could you do, yeah. If you could explain that to sure. us. Sure. Right, yep. So the basis step up. So that's actually a capital gains rule for inherited property. And so how it works is that if there's, uh, say, an intangible like a share of stock uh, that's not sold before the decedent dies, and then that gets passed to an heir, uh, in the hands of the heir, there's a special capital gains rule. Uh, for determining the basis of that property in the hands of the heir. And so just to step back for a minute on that, under the capital gains rules, um, how, how the capital gains tax work, works uh, is that uh, you, the, you're taxed on the gain uh, on the sale of an asset. So you realize the gain, you have to sell it. It's a realization event. So it doesn't happen if uh, uh, that, say, the assets is not sold prior to the death of a decedent. Um, uh, the, the gain is determined based on essentially the selling price of that property minus the basis. The basis of that property uh, is usually just the amount that it costs to acquire that property in the first place. So you pay you know, $100 for a share of stock, uh, and then when you sell it, uh, you sell it for $200, uh, your gain is going to be $200 minus your basis, or $100 in gain. And so then the capital gains tax rates are going to apply to that $100 in gain. And so what the basis step-up rules do for inherited properties, they say in the hands of the heir, um, the basis of that property is not the acquisition cost that the decedent paid for it. The basis of that property is increased. It's stepped up to the value of that asset as of the date of the death of the decedent. So if then that heir turns around and sells that inherited property, they calculate the gain based on the increased basis um, at the date of death of the decedent, not, not the basis that the decedent had for that property. Thank you. I actually understood that for the first time, which I just want to say that I feel really proud of myself about. Um, <laughs> progress. Uh, Madam Chief. Oh, represent, oh, just a moment. Representative Davids, did you have a, a question or a comment? Yeah, I, I do. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. A couple questions. First of all, Mr. Kleeman, how, uh, and thank you, Madam Chair, how many states have a state estate tax currently? Mr. Kleeman. Uh, Madam Chair and Representative Davids, uh, I believe it's 13 states right now, so 33 states do not have it, and District of Columbia, I believe, has one too. Representative okay. Davids. Thank you. Um, so when you talk about the intangible, intangible assets, that could be brokerage accounts, annuities, life insurance, it could be uh, IRAs. What happens if I've got two million bucks in an IRA, uh, I pass away, there'd probably be a spousal continuation, or if my spouse is deceased, there could be uh, an inherited or a stretch IRA, but how would my $2 million IRA 
I shouldn't get so personal. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> hypothetically, <laughs> hypothetically, how would a $2 million IRA that goes on to spousal continuation be treated? Is there a stepped-up basis there? Because I, I buy the stock at, it cost me 300000 now it's worth $2 million. Upon death, there'd be a spousal continuation unless you have required minimum distributions. If you're over age, it's going to be 73 now. But the stepped-up basis apply to IRAs? Mr. Clayman. Uh, Madam Chair and Representative Davids, um, I, I don't know off the top of my head. I'd have to I'd have to dig into the rules a little bit more. I can certainly do that and get back to you. But and and thank you, Madam Chair and Mr. Clayman. We'll have that discussion. But you said stepped up basis. I know in my con my area, it's a big deal for farmland that somebody bought at three hundred. They worked their whole life there, and now they sell out for six thousand. I advise my clients: don't sell your farm, die with it. Because if you die with it, now it's you go up to the $6,000 per acre and your heirs, that's their new basis. Does that apply to other things other than farmland? Is it to a house? Is it to stock accounts? Is it to other things? Or is it stepped up basis basically for property? Mr. Clayman. Uh, uh, Madam Chair and Representative Davids, yeah, so it's a capital gain rule um, for, I believe it's for any inherited capital asset. So it would be a full range of property. If that's not correct, I'll, I'll correct the record and get back to you. But I believe that's what the that gain rule says. Thank Representative you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank Great. You. Thank you. Yep, Representative Smith. Uh, so obviously the estate tax, some of the economic uh, ideals behind that is, uh, is keeping generational wealth from continuing to pass on and getting to the point where uh, it's, it's keeping capital from the vast majority of the population. A lot of times, large fortunes like this are passed on through trusts. I'm, I'm curious, what's the, how does the estate tax interact with those larger trusts that sometimes have been in place for hundreds of years? Mr. Clayman. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative, um, I, that's another question I think I'd want to just kind of do a sidebar on and do a little bit more research on that. I know that there can be estate planning um, decisions that are made that involve trusts um, that may have an, an impact or implication on the estate tax. Um, but I, I'd want to look into that further before, before making any comments on that, okay. if, if that's okay. Representative Smith. Yes. Uh, thank you. I'd love more on that. That's my I think you're good. Oh, I'm good. Okay. Uh, Representative Anderson. Um, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, you um, said there's 13 states that have a state, a state tax only. And I think in Minnesota we were trying to, uh, Representative Davids had the numbers, but the, the first 2.8 million in an estate is excluded from any taxes. Correct. Is it, I'm sorry, Mr. Clayman, or is, is that a two point? Excuse me. Is it two point? Ms. Representative Davids, Mr. Clayman. Uh, Madam Chair and Representatives, uh, it's I believe it's three million now. So that okay. there was a step up. There was kind of a stepwise increase in that exclusion, and now it's three million. Okay, Representative Anderson. Thank you. So the first three million in any estate is excluded from any taxes. Um, at the federal level, it's eleven million. It's the first eleven million. And I think that's um, part of why there's trust in Minnesota to try to get a, you know, deal with the fact that there's a $3 million, you know, here uh, um, only exclusion comparatively, especially as it relates to farmland and so on. But do you, do you have um, 300 acres? This, yeah. Do you have uh, data um, that you could get us that would show the other states and what their um, exclusion is, the ones that have? A state, a state tax. Mr. Clayman. Sure, Madam Chair, Representative Anderson. Sure, yeah, I could get you a, you know, a, a chart that shows of the other states that have any either an estate or an inheritance tax. You know what their, what their exclusion or you know some states may have a, a kind of a different way of doing it, maybe a subtraction or deduction or something. But yeah, I could I could certainly get a chart. Thank you, Madam Chair. That would be helpful, I think. Yeah. Oh. Thank you, Representative Anderson. Mm -hmm. Representative Yuakim. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Clayman, can you remind me, though, with ag property, that exemption's higher, isn't it? Rep uh, Mr. Clayman. Uh, so, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Yuakim, um, yes, yeah, so there's a th the $3 million exclusion, and that applies to the first $3 million um, dollars in value of an estate. Uh, but then there, there is an additional $2 million 
uh, dollars of which of, of an exclusion uh, for either qualified farm property or qualified small business property in the state. So that exclusion um, can actually go up to five million dollars if those uh, other subtractions are applicable. But where are my kids going to be disappointed? Uh, <laughs> Representative <laughs> David. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'm I'm glad whoever uh, Representative Joachim brought that up because when we wrote the law on that, it was a million at the state level, and then we have ratcheted our way up. I, I personally don't think there should be no state taxes. I think, you know, you're dead and we tax you anyways. It's kind of mean, uh, in my humble opinion. But while we did put a provision in there and what Governor Dayton, it was interesting conversation with Governor Dayton because he said, oh, David, you're just for the rich. You're just for the rich. I'm going, I said, do you, do you really consider a farmer with 160 acres and land at that time was 11, 12,000 bucks an acre? Do, why should they have to sell a farm because somebody died? Well, those are the farms we should have, you know, 168, whatever. And so then we were able to get that number up, and it was on an escalator to go up. I thought it was 2.8, but 3 million, whatever it is now. But we made, an ex we made an exception for farms and small businesses that they could go up to 5 or 5 point something. Is it 5 even or 5.4? Mr. Clayman? Yeah, so Madam Chair, Representative Davids, how, how it works is that it's, it, because of that stepwise increase in that exclusion, so you could go up to $5 million, you could fill in up to $5 million uh, with those qualified farm or small business property subtractions. So as that stepped up, as the that initial exclusion stepped up, um, then the amount of those qualified farm and small business property subtractions then decreased because the $5 million cap stayed the same. And it's just sort of the proportion that changed. And, and thank Representative you, Ma David. And thank you, Madam Chair. And, and that was a big deal back in the day, and I think it's still is today. But there were provisions in there you had to, uh, it had to be like a family member that held it for three years or something like that, which I put in there for a reason. The reason was I just didn't want this being used by anybody if they weren't farming or weren't running a small business. So what we did is we put, and Governor Dayton agreed to it, uh, that we put in there that if you held the asset for three years, and that's helped a lot of folks in my area, and I'm sure across the state, to be able to keep the farm in the family. And of course, those numbers are kind of low right now, probably, but but they're, it's better than three million. And at the time, it was working its way up from what? One point something. No. Okay, that was the same. I was I'm just trying to say, Madam Chair, it's yeah, a good no. thing, and it's a good thing, and just always remember, too much of a good thing is a good thing. There's a country song in there somewhere, I'm sure. Isn't there? Well, I'm, I, I'm just disappointed that I didn't get a song on the floor the other day, so I'm glad we're making up for it well, It's now. coming. Okay. I, I have I'm working on some Tom Petty songs right oh. now. It's very flattering. Very, Excellent. Very good. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say one thing, because... This sort of just just occurred to me the other um, the other day back on this intangible property point, and I appreciate Representative Smith for um, for just kind of pointing us toward the way that wealth passes between generations in our country and the way that that has contributed to economic inequality. Um, because what we see over time is just greater and greater stratification of wealth in, uh, you know, kind of, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, right, but we've all sort of heard, oh, you know, over the last 20 years, the top 1% now holds this, holds so much more wealth than, than that bottom half of us, right? Um, and, you know, most sort of working class or middle class people, if they're lucky enough to have an asset to pass on to their heirs, it's in our homesteads, right? It's it's in our houses. Um, however, so however, people who are invested in the stock market or who have other intangible property, um, that's that's a way that, you know, that's another way of passing um, passing wealth onto your heirs. And it occurred to me, I was like, mm -hmm. You know, with I, I'm actually a new homeowner. Like I bought a house, I think a year ago or so. Thank you very much. Um, and you pay kind of on your unreal uh, on your gains in your house before you realize the gain through property taxes, right? Your property taxes go up. You know, obviously based on levy and other stuff, but with the valuation of the house. And so, and so I was just, it just sort of occurred to me uh, the way that, you know, that we treat real property and intangible property in very different ways. Because my house, if it goes up, you know, 
if it goes up 20 grand, then my share of the property tax levy goes up in sort of a commensurate way. But if my intangible property, if my, you know, during, for example, like we saw those, that sort of explosion in, in income and corporate, it, um, in taxes collected in, from income taxes and corporate profits during the pandemic. And, you know, I remember reading that during the pandemic, uh, the value of the stock market went up a trillion dollars. So certain people, right? got a trillion dollars during that time. Again, as we talked about yesterday, right, that, that frontline workers were getting sick, people were dying, um, people were unemployed, our small Main Street businesses were suffering, restaurants were closed, uh, theaters and performance venues were closed. Um, and, you know, that intangible property, those stocks, those, those, gain, those unrealized gains that happened during the pandemic, they don't get taxed on that. Mm -hmm. But on my real property, if I have a gain that I don't realize, I get taxed on that. And that just, just like, I, I never had really thought about that until I literally yesterday I was, you know, thinking about taxes like I do at night now, apparently. <laughs> and I was like, man, that's so unfair. You so, get over it. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Rep. Davids doesn't think about taxes at night anymore. He has other matters to attend to. But um, I just wanted to make that comment, I guess, um, because this, this idea of, of um, sort of, you know, the tax implications of gains that have not been realized is, is just, uh, it's sort of a perpetual <laughs> issue or, or, it's, or it's something that, you know, I know I'm talking to people from other states who are kind of grappling with it, right, of like, you know, how is it that we treat the assets that working class people and middle class people have equal to the assets and the ways that the ultra wealthy, like, um, pass their wealth onto their heirs. So um, I, I, I don't know, Representative Swidzinski, if you had a, a well, comment or. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would just kind of maybe finish your thought. And I know uh, we've gotten to know each other a little bit. I know you, you've, you've, you've contemplated that as a, you know, that unrealized gains taxed on those and raising taxes on unrealized gains. And, you know, we've said, you know, as Republicans, you know, that seems like an interesting idea. But, you know, in the practicality of the sense, so, you know, I forget what year you were elected, let's say 2018, I think. Um, if you, if let's say we went to, uh, let's pick a stock of Tesla, which has seen probably a pretty heavy rise. It probably started in 2018. I'm going to guess it was probably 60 bucks uh, a share. And 2018, and at the peak, you know, so in 2021, let's say we implemented that same tax, you'd have had tax being uh, levied on stock that went up to $400. Mm -hmm. So you had unrealized gains, the ownership stayed in the same hand, and today that same stock's maybe at 150 bucks. So you tax something that was never realized that could, and then it, let's say you sell it today. So how does that get unwound? Well, you have an unrealized gain and you tax it, but it was never sold. And now you have taxes that may have, over that period of time, actually, outpace the actual value of the stock. So let's say over those three or four years that you saw intense growth, that the actual tax paid over three years actually outweighed the actual final sale of the, the stock. Because it was overvalued or whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. Someone fell into unsocial graces with the powers that be in Washington. Um, you know, that's very, that's, that's very messy. And it's, it's exceptionally, it's one thing if something's sold or transferred, that's one thing, but to, to, to try to tax something that's never been realized, well, when it is realized, that's when the problem comes. And so that's the fear that I have, you know, when we're having these conversations, I think other states have contemplated that type of a taxation, uh, you know, in a property tax. And I, and I would say, you know, if, you know, that's one of the issues that I think most folks do when they contemplate the idea of property tax when it comes to homes. So let's say you have the wrong political belief and or whatever that might be, let's say uh, a local levy was passed, you can't afford it. I mean, you look at most of the publicly owned land in the state of Minnesota, that was privately held land and it was lost through someone's inability to pay the property taxes on it. Is that right? Someone that worked, bought it from someone, gained it through the homestead things that happened 100 years ago um, you know, if you're losing real property because you weren't able to pay, make the pay, payment to the government, you know, is that justifiable? 
Is that correct? Because then you have to ask yourself, do you actually own it if you, di if you didn't pay that? Well, you know, let's say t tomorrow you said, you know what? I'm going to stand up for what I believe in. I'm not, I don't believe in what the city of Minneapolis is or wherever you represent. I'm not going to pay those taxes anymore. I'm sick and tired of it. I'm, so I'm just going to live in my house, mind my own business, not use things. But guess what? You do that long enough, you'll be on the street. Regardless of your place. If you've got a mansion, same deal. If you've got a hundred grand house, same deal. And so you know, that's that unrealized gain. But at the end of the day, who actually owns it? Is it the government that owns your property that you work for, that you sweat over, that you put your equity into, uh, that you pay taxes on, that you pay you know, income taxes and take the money that's left over at income taxes and put it in and then you stand up for something. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's very complicated. And, uh, you know, I know, I don't know if that's a plan of yours to move that bill forward, but um, there's, a, there's a lot to think about with that particular issue. So, sorry. No, uh, Representative Swinsinski, don't apologize. I appreciate hearing your perspective on it. And it kind of sounds like you and I agree that there is a disparity in the way that these two categories of properties are treated, right? Um, that obviously in our tax code, we, p we pick winners and losers, right, in, in ways. We try not to. We went over the, those um, principles of a, of a good tax system in the beginning from, from the GAO. Uh, but, you know, I guess... Um, we, we maybe agree that there's a disparity and then we disagree about what the solution is, um, you know, in part because I guess like, you know, the, the guy sitting in his house, however much it's worth, like when he calls 911, he wants somebody to come. Mm -hmm. And so and so he is using public services that are that are supported through that property tax levy. Um, but, you know, I, I guess I just think of it as how are we treating the assets of working class and middle class people different than we're treating the assets of the ultra wealthy? And how do we how do we like think about those two things and still also keep in mind that we do have, you know, an obligation to fund the public good with our with our taxes? Um, and, you know, I know you and I probably will get to different conclusions on that, but um, but just appreciate hearing your perspective. Sure. Just a moment. Uh, and Representative Swidzinski. No, I think, you know, I think that's absolutely correct. You know, I think it's just our our tendency. Right. Our tendency is. So how do you make that even? You know, we should say we should. How do you err on a side of an issue? Do you err on the taking, which would be like, well, in order to make this even, I want to make sure that we just if you fall on hard times or you have some assets that government always errs on the side of make sure that we take it from the people. And conservatives say, well, if you you know, I would argue that no one should lose their property if they don't pay property taxes, that you, you deserve a domicile and whatever that might be. Um, and uh, on the other side, you should err on, well, we shouldn't take if it's, it means that you're going to lose something. If you're going to lose the farm, if you're going to lose that nest egg that grandma and grandpa saved up and mom and dad, we shouldn't err that direction. So. <laughs> Thank you, Representative Swinsinski. I think there's going to be more uh, conversation to happen along this line as we move through our work together over the next few months. Uh, Representative Anderson. Um, I'm, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just I'm trying to Google it, but the, the, the issue you talked about with the homes, I think that there's the, um, it's been tried to solve through the homestead exclusion. So when a home is sold and it's a single, you know, it's an owner-occupied home and you live in it for two years or more, um, there is no capital gain taxes on it. You can roll it into another, but there's no taxes. And maybe the gentleman know the exact dollar amount of that right now? Uh, Mr. Kleeman, or Ms. I don't know if that's a, Mr. Swanson, <laughs> uh, or Mr. Kleeman. Madam Chair, <laughs> yes. we, we might take team this one too. So cool, okay. So <laughs> taxes right. crosses a bunch of different areas, it so does. we often have some overlap. Oh. Um, I think, uh, uh, Madam Chair, Representative Anderson, I think maybe what you're referring to is the exemption under the exemption. capital gains tax exemption. rules yeah. for primary residents. Mm -hmm. So, um, and so I think that probably ties into that homestead credit because there's a similar, I believe, Mr. Yeah. Swanson can correct me, there's a similar mm -hmm. primary residence requirement for that homestead credit right. refund. Uh, it looks like see Mr. Williams coming. It's up like there. Mr. Williams is coming up to our our PTR expert. Uh, <laughs> Chair Gomez and Representative Welcome. Anderson. So the exclusion uh, for capital gains on the sale of primary residence is two hundred fifty thousand dollars for single taxpayers and five hundred thousand dollars for uh, joint insurance. Five hundred. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Williams. So, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, yeah, Representative okay. Anderson. So I think that's how 
that issue that I agree with you, you know, about um, about that it has been dealt with because the first five hundred thousand dollars of a of your single family home is not taxable, whereas every dime of other assets, business, um, stocks, et cetera, are taxable. There's no exclusion there, um, besides the entire estate issue. So Yes, Representative Anderson, thank you. So I mean, kind of what I was talking about, though, was that in a way, the unrealized gains on a homestead are taxed throughout the time that you own it through property tax levies. It's a different mechanism, certainly, but but I but you know that's when when the gain when a gain is realized when you sell an asset then then that's where the um, this exclusion is it an exclusion? Can't remember subtraction uh, exemption exclusion. Uh, Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Cleveland. I think it sort of depends which okay, tax it's okay. version we're talking about. It's okay. so I, I may have conflated, so I apologize if I've caused confusion. We'll yeah. well, we're going to, maybe we'll move on. Uh, yeah. uh, we're going to get a little palate cleanser from Representative Davids. We're counting on you, sir. Well, and, and th thank you, Madam Chair, and very interesting discussion. That's why taxes is so awesome, just a page turner every day. Um, on, it, it frightens me when we talk about taxing unrealized capital gains or taxing things that we haven't received income from yet. I'm not sure how you even do that. So my stock goes up, I get taxed on it, but then it goes down. Do I get a refund from the Department of Revenue? How, how, it's not workable. Uh, and you made a comment, Madam Chair, and there's two comments that I will question every time. One is the ultra wealthy. I want numbers. What is ultra wealthy? I think I'm about there, but I just need to know <laughs> for sure. Um, and the other, for this is for all the members of the committee, if you say fair share, I want a number. What is the number? What payment, yeah, I always hear, pay your fair share. What is that? I want numbers if you use those terms. What is the ultra wealthy? What is the fair share? And I'll ask it every time. And also, our friend Elon Musk uh, set the record books. He's the first man in the world, in the history of the world, to lose $200 billion in one year. And he's still, I mean, that's awesome, isn't it? Couldn't have happened I mean, to a more worthy uh, guy. <laughs> guy as far as I'm We'll concerned. agree on that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Davids. And Representative Smith. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so I, oh, I, I did want to, I thought Representative Kudinski did a good job of presenting some of those challenges we have with taxing unrealized gains. Uh, and those are complications. And uh, Representative Davids also uh, said some good stuff there. But I do think on the other side of things, we have to remember that Unrealized gains have more value in our financial system than purely the dollar and cents that is currently in the brokerage account or wherever they hold it. Uh, we've used Elon Musk a couple times here now, so I'll use him as another example. Um, he was not taxed on his current holdings for that Tesla stock that has gone up and down that had him lose $200 billion, but he did leverage that stock to get $44 billion right. to be able to acquire Twitter. That's money he didn't have, he didn't have in his uh, bank account, but he was able to acquire it because of those unrealized gains. So they are benefiting in many ways, they being the ultra wealthy or whatever you want to say. And I can even say in a local context, as a greater Minnesota resident of places where there's not maybe the ultra, ultra wealthy, we still all know those local small business owners or those big heads who are able to go to banks and get money because of the capital they have access to, even if it's unrealized. And so I think uh, it's messy, but I do think that there's a larger discussion there as well. Thank you, Representative Smith. All right, I think we're going back to the testifying table. Thank you for your indulgence to our great staff. Um. <laughs> uh, so, Madam Chair, just to finish this slide. This, this day, uh, <laughs> Totally fine. Where are we at on it? <laughs> <laughs> Column three. Uh, so, uh, and, and feel, I mean, feel free. We're in, uh, House Research is in no hurry to get this done. So, <laughs> we're, really, we're not. We're you really can stay not. here all night, folks. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Cleveland. This, this is paid by the decedent's estate, so the liabilities on the, the or the incidences on the, uh, the estate. And this is also a, a progressive tax. Uh, and we don't have a chart on here on prog uh, regressivity, progressivity, but it is considered a progressive tax. Again, in large part because of this exclusion that applies um, for that first $3 million in the value of an estate, um, up to $5 million with those two subtractions. Um, th this is just a, a flow chart of just in general how the, um, you know, how a typical estate tax calculation would work. Um, first thing is you start with your federal taxable estate. 
then from that, you subtract those Minnesota exclusions um, that have been discussed previously, the $3 million exclusion than any qualified farmer, uh, a small business property. Uh, um, that gives you your Minnesota taxable estate. Then you, then you impose the rate on that estate. And then there's this other calculation uh, that is kind of like apportionment. So like yesterday, they're, uh, uh, they're in the discussion about uh, apportionment for uh, corporate uh, franchise tax income. Uh, there's a ratio you uh, multiply that by. That's to meet the fairly apportionment uh, standard under constitutional law. There's some similar constitutional issues that come into play uh, with the estate tax. Uh, again, one of those is a state can only a state cannot tax uh, you know tangible or real property that has its situs outside the taxing state. And so there's a, a, a almost like a, a ratio or a factor that's calculated. That's the last step in the estate tax. That's determined by that Minnesota gross estate, you know, divided by the federal gross estate. Uh, and so that makes that calculation that, um, again, complies with those uh, federal constitutional law rules. Um, and Madam Chair, that, that concludes the uh, estate tax uh, presentation. Um, I can certainly take other questions too, but otherwise then uh, Mr. Swanson's up here and he's gonna move to the state general tax. Excellent, that was a, a long three slides that we had. So I uh, appreciate you hanging with us. Not seeing any other questions at the end of that portion of the presentation, so I think we'll move on to you, Mr. Swanson. Welcome to your committee. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record and go ahead. Uh, Madam Chair and members, I'm Jared Swanson with the House Research Department. I primarily staff property tax issues uh, and a few uh, mining taxes as well. Um, so property taxes is, is mostly handled by the, the division. It's, it's primarily a local tax, but um, there is one state general tax revenue, and that comes from the state general property tax. Uh, so the state general levy uh, was established in 2001 as a part of a larger tax reform effort that year. Um, at that time, um, there were some class rate compressions for commercial industrial property. Um, along with some changes to the way school districts are funded and the, the um, elimination of the state general, educa the state general education levy. Um, all that resulted in, in the um, statewide general property tax that is levied on commercial industrial property as well as seasonal recreational property. And the seasonal recreational property you can just think of as it's mainly cabins and resorts. Uh, so currently the levy collects just under $760 million a year, and of that amount, about $717 million comes from the commercial, industrial, public utility property tax base, and the remaining $42 million comes from the seasonal residential recreational tax base. Uh, there have been a number of changes to the gen state general levy in the last five years or so. Uh, so the 2017 <laughs> tax bill eliminated the annual inflationary increase, so when this levy was first established in 2001, it was annually indexed to inflation. Uh, that annual inflation increase was eliminated in the 2017 tax bill. The 2019 tax bill reduced the overall levy, so both the, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the commercial industrial portion and the seasonal recreational portion were reduced by a combined fi uh, $50 million. And then in 2021, the first $150,000 of uh, commercial industrial market value was exempt from state general levy. Uh, along with that change, there was a, a reduction uh, by about $20 million in the CI portion of the levy just to prevent any shifting of the remaining levy onto other properties. And Madam Chair, that concludes my presentation of the State General Levy. Thank you, Mr. Swanson. Uh, Representative Swazinski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a question. Uh, from the statewide business property tax, you mentioned a uh, utility. And so I'm assuming that's a electrical utility. Any idea roughly, you know, what percentage, so the statewide business property tax in real property, uh, put of these attacks on whether it be, um, you know, nuclear generational sites, uh, cold sites, uh, the rest. Any idea what that total number is uh, as far as the extra cost to rate payers that uh, is levied through the statewide business prop property tax? Mr. Swanson. Uh, Madam Chair and Representative Swazinski, I, I'm not sure. Um, you know, it, I think it would be pretty closely tied to the, the, the overall tax amount paid by those types of property. I don't know that number off the top of my head, but I could um, I could get the committee the, the amount of state general tax paid by public utility property. Thank Rep you. Both investor-owned and, and if cooperative. I don't know if cooperative would be different as far as the generation capacity, but. Uh, Mr. Ma Swanson. Madam Chair, I, I'm not sure I have that broken out, but if I do, I'll, I'll break that up as well. Good. Representative Swazinski? Excellent. All right. Um, not seeing any other questions, so maybe we're going back to Ms. Hagler's area.
Okay, um, Madam Chair. Um, uh, just for the record, this is Alex Hagler, um, House Research. So um, the remainder of the taxes we're going to talk about are some of the um, smaller state excise taxes, and um, I'm going to start with the cigarette and tobacco products. Um, Ms. Hagler, sorry, before you go on, can you just explain to us what an excise tax is, please? Sure. Um, yes, Madam Chair. Thank you. <laughs> members, um, an excise tax is um, kind of like a sales tax, but um, it's imposed at um, like a distributor um, type level instead of the like point of sale uh, retail level. Thank you very much. Um, so the cigarette and uh, tobacco products tax, um, I said before during the sales tax presentation that um, the state sales tax doesn't apply to um, these products. Um, however, there is a $3.04 per pack um, tax plus the in lieu sales tax of 63 cents on um, each pack of cigarettes and small cigars. Um, and these taxes are paid by uh, the licensed distributor. And for tobacco products, the tax is 95% of the wholesale price. And um, these products include items like cigars, um, pipe tobacco, chewing tobacco, and also vapor products. Premium cigars, however, have a little bit of a different tax. They are taxed at um, just 50 cents per cigar. Great. Ms. Hagler, before we go on, uh, Representative Joy. Madam Chair, on the cigarette and small uh, cigar and tobacco tax, you know, I think originally was that proposed as a health impact fee? In Minnesota, correct? Ms. Hagler. I, Madam Chair um, and Representative, I believe so. I'm not 100% sure. I would have to get back to you on that. That predates my time at House. Okay. Representative Chair. Mad Madam Chair, I guess one of the things I'd like to look at too as we're discussing all these things is, um, you know, like up where I live, close to North Dakota, it's about a $30 to $40 difference of cigarettes going across the border and mm. Many customers buy cigarettes over there and come back to Minnesota. I'd like to know if that grow if that's been a growth in that category or if that's been a shrink because of the bordering states where we're at on that. I think that'd be a good one to look into. But I'm just also would like to know when that if that's still called a health impact fee or if that's changed. So, all right, thank, thank you. you for that, Representative Joy, and I appreciate the perspective from um, many of our members who have these border issues because I think in taxes, it's it's these are big a big deal, and so thank you for bringing that up. And maybe we can we can just have a little bit of a follow up from um, House Research. And I think I see Representative Pinto. If you wanted to go ahead. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just asking about the in lieu sales tax. I guess I'm not sure. Is that because it's not subject to the sales tax? And then sort of how's that calculated? And is that true for other products that don't have sales tax? If you just explain that, thank you. Ms. Hagler. Uh, Madam Chair and Representative Pinto, yes. So it is because there is no state sales tax that 6.875% doesn't apply. So this is in lieu of that. And um, there is, I believe, the same thing on like lottery mm. type things. Um, but that's the only one I know of off the top of my head. Okay, Great. Thank you, Representative Pinto. Representative Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, maybe someone who has been around. I, I'm curious why the pull tabs is such a higher tax rate than bingo. Okay, let's let's let Ms. Hagler move through these other two, and then we'll get into the pull tab v bingo conversation okay. on when we get to the fourth column. I think. Thank you. <laughs> Madam, Ms. Hagler, Madam Chair and members, I was um, actually going to talk about that next. So yeah, um, the lawful gambling taxes, also known as charitable gambling taxes, um, there are two different kinds. Um, there is um, a flat tax of eight point five percent on paper bingo, raffles, and paddle wheel games. And then um, the second tax is the combined net receipts tax um, that has a graduated schedule, um, much like the income tax that starts at 9% and goes up to 36%. And those um, are imposed on pull tabs, electronic bingo, and tip boards. Um, this does also predate my time at House Research and before um, these <coughs> were in place, but um, the disparity um, between which games are taxed, what I believe was just kind of a, a revenue raiser decision. Um, Representative Anderson? Oh, sorry. Great. Representative Anderson? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Does anyone know? Is anyone here that? Why that is? Oh, I was here. Why? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's something we can look into and get, and get yeah. back to you. I'll just have to do a little bit of a 
deeper dive to my predecessor's <laughs> extensive notes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, those of us, we, I came in in 19, and so Pat Dalton was still on, on staff at that time, and I know that, that, that uh, so Alex's predecessor, I'm certain, has, uh, um, was tracking this, and so we'll, we'll uh, get that information to you. Thank you. In the future, thank you. And uh, Representative Elkins. Yeah, um, thank you, Madam Chair. A uh, question I had is, w would the motor vehicle sales tax kind of fit into this category as well? Representative, or Rep Ms. Hagler. Mm -hmm. um, Madam Chair and Representative Elkins, um, I'm sorry, which category were you referring to? Uh, it is a ca general category of other state taxes. Ms. Hagler. Uh, Madam Chair and Representative Elkins, yes, um, that would fall into uh, just another um, revenue raiser for the state, um, the motor vehicle sales tax. Um, we don't, this is not typically the jurisdiction of the taxes committee, so we haven't included any slides, but we can definitely get you any information you'd like. Um, if any transportation related bills do come to the committee, we would um, give an overview at that point, possibly. Thank you. Um, Great. Yeah, Ms. Mr. Klingman will um, finish out the rest of the tax. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair and members, uh, so uh, once again, I'm Chris Klayman with the House Research Department. Um, I'm going to cover alcoholic beverage taxes, and then we have another slide on a, a four other state taxes. That's our last substantive slide. Um, one, one of the reasons, I'll just say this too, just by way of introductions, um, one of the reasons I'm going to talk about the alcohol uh, beverage excise taxes because uh, I also staff the area of liquor regulation for House Research. So for members that have served on the Commerce Committee or, or are serving currently, you might bump into me there too. Um, so the alcoholic beverage excise taxes, one unique thing about these taxes uh, compared to all these other taxes is they're just volume based. Um, so I, you, I, I'm not going to read off the amounts uh, per unit of volume here, but you can see um, you can see that for yourself. Um, so basically the increased collections will happen if there's a greater volume um, of those uh, products that are sold in the state. Um, that's again, that's another tax at the wholesale level paid by distributors. Um, there's one exception to that though, and that's that last bullet point. It's the 2.5% alcohol gross receipts tax. So that's a gross receipts tax. These are all consumption taxes. Um, I think a gross receipts tax is probably somewhere in between an excise tax and a sales tax. I mean, some might consider it just to be an additional sales tax. Um, and that's in place. The history of that is that before the adoption of the streamlined sales and use tax agreement, the, um, the state sales tax in alcoholic beverages uh, was 9%. Then you had to lower that to, to hit the uniform rate requirement for streamline. And so then there's this other 2.5% gross receipts tax that's on top of that. Um, so it's the, the excise taxes, which are these sort of traditional, you know, volume-based taxes imposed at the wholesale level, then the, the liquor retailers then impose this 2.5% gross receipts tax. There's also a sales tax that's going to apply to those purchases too. Uh, thank you. Uh, Representative Kosnick, did you have a question before we can move on? Uh, I did, uh, Rep, uh, Chair. And there's a more of a popularity um, in emerging in the liquor industry of a kind of a spritzer, a vodka spritzer, gin spritzer, some of that. Um, at what rate are they taxed? At you know, are they more probably more like a beer to the consumer, um, maybe kind of like wine, or are they taxed at the full distilled spirits? Because there's a big discrepancy in the tax here. Mr. Clayman, do you have any comments on White Claw? Yep. Thank well, uh, Madam Chair, <laughs> I'm sorry, you, Madam Chair, since you brought it up, I, you know, I, I, I know your side probably does prefer the white claws. We're kind of more the high noons. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa! I didn't even know. I didn't know. There's stilly, stilly, stilly. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mr. Clayman. <laughs> Madam Chair, Representative Kosnick. So far as I know, my understanding is, is that for say like a prepackaged cocktail. That would be subject to that distilled spirits excise tax. Oh. So. Full ounce or by liquor volume? Uh, well, yeah, let's go through the chair, please, you guys, even though we're having fun. <laughs> Mr. Clayman. Uh, Ma Madam Chair and um, Representative Swazinski, well, that, you know, that's a good question. So I'd, I'd have to get back to you on that just to make sure I can strain it all out. 
No worries. Thank you, Mr. Clayman. Appreciate it. Oh, and then uh, Representative Smith. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I assume that most of these uh, consumption taxes are also regressive. Um, I assume you don't have it on you, but are you able to send us information on how that breaks down with what you did with some of the other uh, taxes you have in this packet for us? Uh, Madam Chair. Oh, Mr. Clayman. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative, um, yeah, we could provide that for you too. Um, you know, we pull all that information too from the uh, Department of Revenue Tax Incident Study. Um, so there should be some for more detailed information in that too, but we can, we can provide that to, to you and the other members of the committee. Great. Representative Smith, you good? You, okay, excellent. Mr. Clayman. Uh, so, Madam Chair, uh, just moving on to the, oh, we've already, uh -oh. already, already gone there. Um, so the, the last four taxes, I'm just going to touch on these briefly. Uh, the, the first two, that's the mortgage registry tax and the deed transfer tax. Um, th these are based on, so the mortgage registry tax, that's based on uh, the, when you record a mortgage at, at the county, um, you're going to pay a, a tax at the rate that's listed up there on the amount of principal debt uh, that's recorded for that mortgage. Um, I believe that that also is going to apply to assignments of mortgage too. For the deed transfer tax, that's just the transfer on the ownership of real property. Um, so, you know, uh, mortgages and notes, I guess, for people familiar with the, the mortgage business. But. Um, and so that's 0.33% on the deed transfer tax. That's the amount paid. So the amount of consideration, just the amount paid um, okay. for, for that sale of real property. Uh, moving on, uh, Minnesota care taxes. Uh, I guess there is a typo in the Minnesota care tax uh, column. That is 1.6% or 0.3. There's a, an adjustment that can happen under the uh, Minnesota provider tax. Uh, and so that's 1.6% uh, for 2023. Um, that applies to healthcare providers, so hospitals, surgical centers, um, and also wholesale drug distributors. Uh, again, that's a 1.6% tax. And then the last tax um, uh, on this slide to talk about is the insurance premiums tax. I guess this is another one of those taxes where they're exempt and then there another tax is imposed on them. Uh, so insurance companies are exempt from paying uh, the income tax, so the corporate franchise tax, and instead they pay uh, a gross premium tax. So they pay a tax on a, you know, a higher base at a lower rate. So that's pretty typical throughout the country. I don't think there's any state that uh, doesn't do it that way uh, in general. Um, and so different types of uh, insurance companies have different rates under those, um, under that insurance premium tax. Oh, sure. And Madam Chair, I think Ms. Hagler has some further comments. Great, Ms. Hagler. Um, Madam Chair and members, on page, just going back um, to Representative Smith's question, on page 60 of the very long and detailed handout, um, there is a graph that shows the tax incidence of the um, fuel, cigarette, and tobacco, or and alcohol taxes that shows the breakdown by quintile of the, um, the re regressivity of the tax. Um, that shows that the first, the bottom 20% of um, taxpayers are paying 2.7% of income, while the top 20% um, are only paying 0.3%. Uh, so that is shown on a graph on page 60, much like the graphs that we had for the income, corporate, and um, sales tax. Thank you, Ms. Hagler. And it sounds like uh, Representative Smith, we, we got to pass the tax, tax incidence study along to him so he can he can uh, dig in. It's 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 actually a really amazing document that the DOR puts out every two years. I know we're changing the schedule of it because of the Tax Expenditure Review Commission. They, they do them every other year. And I think we're going to be without a big publication this year. And then we're going, I, yeah. So. But there is a great document that goes over every tax and assigns it, uh, you know, it's called a suits index based on its relative progressivity. And we'll probably uh, do an overview of that at some point, but also like just for you to check out on your, at night when you're thinking about taxes like me. Um, Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Clayman, uh, these taxes on slide 48, the mortgage registry, the deed, and the other taxes, uh, do the revenues generated, are they, do they go to a specific fund or the general fund? Mr. Clayman. 
Uh, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Kosnick, um, so the uh, the counties can, I believe, keep a portion of that tax, uh, and then the rest goes to the the general fund, a pretty high percentage. Is I'm going to phone a friend potentially. Ninety-seven percent, Madam Chair, Representative. Uh, Ninety-seven percent goes to the general fund. Three percent to the counties. So for those two taxes. And then, uh, Representative Kosnick, were you asking about the health care access fund also, or or were you more more just about the mortgage and deed registry? As a former mortgage person, Madam Chair, I was, I was specific okay. about the mortgage and deed tax, but also the other two. I'm curious if uh, yeah those funds go to yeah, Mr. Clayman, if you could. Yeah, ma Madam Chair and members, yes. Yeah, so the the that's a again another uh, item to note on the um, on the insurance premium tax on HMOs. So that's dedicated to the health care access fund. And um, uh, Ms. Templin from House Fiscal may be able to tell us the amounts if if, uh, if the committee would like to know. Otherwise, we can just move on. But. I'm sure that Mr. McQuillan knows how much is in the health care access fund because he was our health guy before. But maybe we won't put him on the spot like that. <laughs> Anyway, um, I think if uh, Representative Kosnick, if you do, do you want us to get those no, numbers I, to you? Are you okay? Okay. I just to know if they went into it. Okay. Dedicated yeah. Process. Great. More questions? Yes, uh, Representative Pinto. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just asking. So the so the HMO insurance premium tax goes in the healthcare access fund. The other insurance taxes go into the general fund, or you can just clarify that. Mr. Clayman. Uh, Madam Chair and Reps of Pinto, um, you know, I may need to get back to you on that. Uh, there are some, there, I think there are some other, uh, so uh, Madam Chair, Reps of Pinto, so my colleague Ms. Hagler actually has uh, some further information on that. Excellent. So um, yeah, so the healthcare access fund, uh, that's funded with the taxes paid in part, at least by HMOs and nonprofit health service plan corporations. So that kind of universe of, uh, of taxpayers. Um, okay, so the special revenue fund then gets proceeds from, there's a fire safety surcharge under the uh, insurance premiums tax. And so that goes into the special revenue fund. Uh, and then the rest of the insurance taxes then just flow into the general fund. So I think outside the HMOs and, and health insurance companies, I think a good rule of thumb is most of that's going to the general fund. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Clayman. Uh, so, Madam Chair and, and members, um, you, you may have noticed us consulting a, a particular publication just now as we were looking for more information on these taxes. Yeah. Um, so that's our Minnesota tax handbook. Um, that's actually number three uh, on this slide, this final slide. This is just a slide that shows some of those publications. Um, uh, that uh, members of this committee can expect um, throughout the years. The, the first one is that Minnesota tax incidents study. And we've researched that a lot uh, in house research and house fiscal uh, throughout this presentation. So um, that's one report to look for. These are biennial for one of these reports, as you, as you mentioned, Madam Chair, um, I think there's a year where that's going to get skipped, but, uh, and then the, the other uh, report is the tax expenditure budget. So the tax incident study looks at incidents, tax expenditure, then itemizes and goes through the you know estimated costs for the tax expenditures in the state. Uh, and then there's the Minnesota Tax Handbook, also a biennial publication, and that's just kind of like a quick reference to this is the taxes, how much it raises, this is where the money goes. So um, you can look for uh, those publications in the future. Let's say we wanted uh, one of those blue handbooks in our just to look at uh, where would we get those, you guys? Do you know? Oh, Cynthia Templin's coming up. <laughs> Sorry. I don't mean to be like... uh, Madam Chair, Cynthia Templin, House Fiscal Staff. Um, these booklets, I've been informed by Tax Research and DOR, will be delivered to individual members via their mailboxes. Great. You should be getting them this week if they're not already there. Perfect. Some of us are having FOMO, so I appreciate you uh, sending those over. Thank you, Ms. Bears. And um, Madam Chair, um, that concludes our presentation. All right. Uh, any final questions from any member? Um, before we adjourn, we're going to Representative Davids. 
Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Just a couple quick things. First of all, I would really suggest that every member of this committee uh, get their hands on the tax incident study. And when did we say the next one should be out? Well, I think it's supposed to be this year, but it's going to be next year. Is that what is happening? Yeah, because there's something about it lining up with the Tax Expenditure Review Commission and the Tax Expenditure Budget. So. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. And I would suggest that every member of this committee uh, grab the old one and yeah. memorize it. Uh, that'll really cut down on questions around here. Um, <laughs> because that's a very, very important document that tells you uh, how much extra money that I'm paying that I shouldn't have to. Uh, that being said, I also have a question, Madam Chair, on committee rules. Uh, this is the season for committee rules to come out, and they're all over the board. Some have like 30 pages that they tacked onto a door in some place in Germany. Um, <laughs> or, I guess, first of all, wondering if you're going to have committee rules, but if you do, I never did, because that little piece of wood right there is the rule. Okay. <laughs> Pulowski has three things. One, be at meetings on time. Two, this is how you pre-file amendments. Three, the chair may waive or amend rules at their discretion. That's my kind of rules. <laughs> so so just, just a thought. You're, you're the chair. If you want to have a whole bunch of rules, fine. Uh, I never did, and I've chaired committees 14 years uh, because you have the rule right there. I mean, thank you, Representative Davids. I may be, you know, a little more of a, a, an egalitarian uh, have a, approach to the, to the whole uh, proceedings, but I appreciate your input. Um, I, I uh, and we are working on rules. We've been a little busy in taxes, you know, this week, so it hasn't been at the top of my of my list. But I am taking your input that, hey, I, I didn't know you could just, like, not have rules. I thought you had to have rules. So, M Madam Chair. Yes, yes um, Representative David. We're going to be busy all year. <laughs> well, I hope so. <laughs> There's much work to do. Um, I just, uh, before we adjourn, I just wanted to mention that while we were meeting here, um, the Senate passed the conformity bill off the floor, 67 to 0. So, again, just... Uh, we can all clap, why not? <laughs> Just amazing work by our staff and, you know, and appreciate the collaboration between, between our caucuses and, and the specific work that I know that the tax committee members in the GOP caucus put into making this happen. So thank you all very much. And with that, we are adjourned.